Hello, this is Agnès Guerreau talking to you from Lyon, France. I would like to discuss today what I would call the hyper appearance of music. I would like to reconsider here our contemporaneous experience of it from the perspective of its relationship to the visual and how, within the multimedia model of communication we're living in, visual domination is an ambiguous companion to our experience of music. In the multimedia era we are living in, more and more as a substitute to real life, at least to embodied life, it appears that music has never been so much held to apparition, I mean visual manifestation. Music is everywhere, embedded within visual mediums, from the innumerable musical videos, not exclusively video clips, to the design of the listening platforms with their flashy color code, orange SoundCloud, green Spotify, blue Facebook. In this context, and the transformations of our life forms induced by the technologies we use daily, I would like to question how this paradoxical hyper-appearance hyper of music might affect our experience of it. Should we consider identifying here a conflict of the senses, a synesthetic war within the economy of attention? When musicians can't escape to use a visual lure for people to click on their musical content, why we, the people, so many times renounce to actually listen because anticipating that it would take too much time and stop us from scrolling from the top to the bottom of a vertical timeline. The hypothesis might sound a bit radical, but worth considering. Is the hyper appearance of music the clue to its invisible disappearance? First, we have to take a little detour through a quick classification of the different ways of viewing music in the many kinds of visual signs of music we have become familiar to. Music obviously belongs to the realm of the invisible. Sound's propagation medium is air, and our eyes are not equipped yet to see this propagation. Sound, music, is audible, that's all. But sounds are frequencies, and frequencies are vibrations. So in a very faint way, sound and thus music can be considered tangible too, but still apart from the visible. However, the visible seems to be the modality of appearance so many of us feel more comfortable with. There is an effort, a difficulty, to focus exclusively on sounds. In ancient Greece, Pythagoras taught his students from behind a veil, so as not to let his presence distract them from the content of his lectures. His acousmatic doctrine established that the sound of the source, sorry, that the source of the sound, its visual origin or context, is unnecessary, if not harmful, to the experience of listening. If sounds are cut from the visible, it is part of their strength and interest. But the desire to establish bridges between the senses can look in many ways emancipatory. Since the beginning of human history, people attempted to express, translate, refer to music through visual signs. Different kinds of signs actually inducing various relationships between image, picture and sound. First, we have the pictorial or photographic representations of instruments, prehistoric flutes, medieval lutes, modern saxophones or guitar, and also the pictorial or photographic representations of musicians, of musical scenes, or even of musical audiences. They are representations that denotate musical object, catching an aspect of it, the visual, the instrument, um, the bodies, its visual appearance. This is what Charles Sanders Peirce calls icons in his theory of sign. Second, we have those very familiar graphic signs 
that represent the characteristic of musical sounds, pitches, harmony, scale, tempo, and their composition, visible in the musical notation. Peers call this kind of sign a symbol. It's arbitrary, but assumed to refer directly to this tree's object. The earliest form of musical notation as symbolic signs denotating music can be found in a cuneiform tablet that was created at Nippur in Babylonia, today's Iraq, in about 1400 before Christ. The tablet represents fragmentary instructions for performing music and the fact that the music was composed in harmonies of thirds and that it was written using a diatonic scale. So this is the kind of visual sign that we could call here symbols of music. Third, we have more contemporary audiovisual signs that could be regarded in a way as musical symbols that are the waveforms on the audio tracks we are, now, we are now used to work with in the musical production software. Waveforms provide a visualization of the audio's, audio file sound waves. It helps editing the track, and again, it confirms that when the ear lacks precision, vision comes to the rescue. But waveforms are shaped in the software after the electric impulse is received by the audio device. Through technological med mediations, there is a casual relationship between the physical phenomenon and the visual appearance of the track, a causal relationship. Thus, it seems we're more dealing here with the kind of sign Pierce calls an index, a sign that is physically caused by what it denotates, like smoke for fire. Even more fitting to this concept would be the apparatus of Clodney, that shows how different resonant frequencies form different pa patterns in a met on a metal plate covered in sound. The complex and symmetric patterns are a direct effect of the per periodical signal. When sound alters matter, and we can notice those alterations, we are still in front of this kind of visual sign that is an index like the microgrooves on the surface of a vinyl record or the visibly pulsating speaker under the impact of very low frequencies, we deal again with the kind of sign Peirce calls index. Fourth type of relationship of music to visual sounds would be when the physical connection becomes a psychocognitive and that visual representation are triggered by musical sounds when the audio simulation leads to visualizations of forms and colors, as in synesthesia. In the phenomenon of synesthesia, the stimulation of a sensory pathway leads to involuntary experiences in a second sensory of co or cognitive pathway, generating associations between the audible and the visual. Many musicians were reported to be synesthites. Ligeti, so major chords in a red and pink tint, and minor chord in a green and brown complexion. Rimsky-Korsakov saw the key of C major in white and B major in metallic blue. As for Duke Ellington, the D evoked for him a blue sackcloth and the G a light blue satin. In 1842, Hungarian composer and pianist Franz Liszt asked the Weimar Orchestra during a rehearsal to play a little bluer, please, and less pink. The composer Alexander Skriabin, more likely a synesthite, was deeply concerned about the association of color with music. He even developed a color-emitting keyboard that he called Tastiera per luce, keyboard of lights, designed precisely for the encounter between music and colors. According to him, color emphasizes tonality. It makes the tone more obvious. The other way around, Kandinsky was well known for his musicalization of the visual exploring the encounter between music and color, 
in his paintings named Compositions, Improvisations, Impressions. Another type of psychocognitive connection, more looser than in synesthetia, is when pictures are inspired by music that functions as a trigger for imagination. That might be the status of the very familiar form of the video clip, from the most hypnagogic pictures we can imagine to narrative sequences. Finally, we have in mind the case of pictures that have to be musicalized, a movie in need of a soundtrack, but many soundtracks are composed before and during the video montage, actually, or an advertisement needing an engaging sound design, or a video game needing an immersive game world to be enhanced by a specific musical ambience. Then ambience, in this case, becomes the typical mode of presence of music. It's a round. And this kind of visual signs of music are surrounding us nowadays. Music there is everywhere, perfecting emotion, but not for that very reason, the center of attention. This scenario is pretty common because most of today's cognitive marketing is visual and visual contents powerfully affect our brains. It might be a norm rather than based on human natural skill, but that norm became for us a second nature. Visual is assumed to provide us a better grasp on things. Our contemporary social media are, con are constantly referring to music using various of uh, the visual sounds we evoked. And it bets on the power, on the unity powers of the sonic and the visual to accomplish the multi-sensory experience of the multitasking 21st century individual. But they ultimately depend on a visual marketing, even for any musical product, from the album covers to Instagram's photos and of course to YouTube's video. Within the frame of most of our social media applications, listening time is shortened to a barren proportion. Of course, a symbol for play appears everywhere. But even the player is the materialization of a specialist time. With its cursor and progression, that amount of listening time that you can apprehend in a blink, quantified in minutes and seconds in an Arabic numeral you're immediately aware of. In these visual symbols, among these visual symbols of music, durée, as Bergson puts it, this fulfilled experience of time, this generative creation of the listening time, seems both instantaneously pre-given and confiscated. Among pictures and visual symbols of music, where do we find any mental space left to the possibility of a visual pose, or the possibility of a visual epoche, a visual bracketing, to borrow Ursel's word, that would let us experience listening as an exclusive activity. Since the beginning of the 20th century and the first account of the reproducibility of image, of pictures and of music itself, critics like Siegfried Krakauer have identified capitalism, consumerist capitalism, as based on a cognitive economy of distraction. Zerstreuung, a floating attention in which sensations are more the fruit of a chance impression than of a sustained attention. In our visual, domina visual domination world, music is everywhere. In our social consumers' lives, music, even the more elaborate one, is mostly experienced as music, that background music designed by George Owen Squire in 1934 in the United States to enhance employees' productivity. In this purpose, music works as an acoustic layer we have to fight to move our attention from. If we want to follow a conversation with friends at the restaurant 
or just answer to another phone call. Music is music's in the air. It surrounds us, yes, but in a weak way, all around, invisible, often detached from its emitting source. It doesn't offer the kind of visual stimulation that focuses attention. It more or less function, functions as a device to maintain distraction. Feel the void, keep going. Eventually, the visual contents that are systematically associated with music determine cultural norms of cognition and experience. And I am starting to wonder, behind the seductive promise of immersion, of a multisensorial experience to which we could fully abandon, there is also a fully synchronized world offering no escape for the viewer, listener. And I remember this scene of Stanley Kubrick's A Clockworks Orange, where the main character is trained to ultraviolet violence by being forced to watch violent images, violent pictures, for extended periods of time as his eyes are held open with specula while listening to Beethoven's music. That might look quite dystopian. But what if today's multi-sensory paradigm of experience was seen as a softened avatar of a clockwork orange's coercitive apparatus of conditioning? It seems the visual sign functions as an imperious, unavoidable stimulus for the viewer to optionally listen. It seems we cannot do without a visual counterpart, as if music was too weak to suggest its own representations. A multisensory experience, yes, but with no space for oral imagination. Against immersion, why wouldn't we favor sometimes a monosensory experience? If visualization is so dominant by contrast, I'd feel free today if listening could still be an activity making me able to suspend, to bracket the dominant. To make sure the actual hyperappearance of music doesn't finally comes down to its quiet disappearance. Music is so visible today, so hip hyperappearance. How we show it helps listening to it. Listen to it.